one. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us in the UK and from everywhere else on the planet. Breaking the myth of identity and access in the cloud. Uh, there are many other titles that I could think about. The Last Frontier, for example, and many others. A couple of quick hygiene issues. This webinar is being recorded, so you can always come back and listen to it. Um, and do share this with your friends. There are downloads available now and after the webinar. Bright Talk allows us to add downloads. So do keep coming back as you may find more interesting collateral for you to read. Uh, Core to Cloud is the main organizer. Thank you to Core to Cloud. And if you have any questions that you uh, specifically want to kind of pass through to any of the vendors, you can always reach out to core2cloud.co.uk. And we'll go into introductions, and then we'll deep dive into the interesting world of identity access. Um, we could spend many days here, but we're going to try to condense all of this in about 45 minutes. I'm the guy with the blue turban, but I'll let uh, Carl, if you don't mind, if you take a minute to introduce who you are and your experience. Sure. Nice to meet you all, and thanks for joining this afternoon. Um, my name is Carl Langford. I'm the Director of Solutions Engineering for Beyond Trust, and I've worked here for a little over five and a half years. Um, in terms of my background and experience, um, really a wide range of experience across different sectors and verticals uh, over the last 10, 14 years. Um, I've, I've been a, a speaker at many different events and I kind of deliver some thought leadership in this space now around privilege access management and remote access. Thank you, Carl. Kevin, to you, sir. Yes, good afternoon all, and thanks for joining. And as I say, I mean, we're here to discuss identity and access management for a period of time. My background in particular is the last 15 years in identity and access management, and more recently done a on-prem to cloud journey myself. So I've been with Okta, who I work for just now, as a regional principal solutions engineer for EMEA, based out of the UK. But I've been at Okta for just over 14 months now, as I say, having com completed a cloud journey on an individual basis but we bring a lot of experience, uh, discussions, and solutions engineering on that basis. Excellent. A quick intro about me, folks. I'm the guy with the blue turban, uh, the only one wearing blue and cyber together. And I have a lot of experience in uh, cyber. I'm a practicing CISO. I run a company called Cyber Management Alliance. And for my sins, I used to be an analyst uh, talking about IAM many, many decades ago. Although in terms of experience, I'm only 22 years old. In fact, I could let's ask Carl, how old are you in terms of experience, sir? Oh, 14, 15, <laughs> I think. 15. Oh, that makes me <laughs> Kevin, how old are you in terms of experience? Oh, well, from the IT <laughs> the to IT industry, uh, unfortunately, over 30 odd years of IT experience. Excellent. In that makes me somewhere of, in the middle. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. So so folks, the, the the I mean, like I said, we can spend a lot of time, but let's focus on the pandemic. But the reason I bring that up is IAM traditionally, I mean, and there are many people in the cloud, you know, that um, we've done many other webinars you should uh, uh, listen to, uh, but the cloud has been around for a long time, the, the SaaS models, but I, I need your experience because you are facing, as much as we are facing clients, but you also talk to clients, you know, with, 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 with uh, resellers and distributors, et cetera. But what are you seeing when it comes to adoption of, identity access, managing all of this, privileged access management. Um, has the pandemic made a difference? Carl, I'll start with you first, and then, Kevin, you can take over when Carl is done. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I definitely think there has been a huge difference. I mean, if you think about this, it, it's very basic. Um, information security departments are, are really operating in a world that changed overnight. You know, the operating model and threat model for their organization suddenly flipped a switch with the uh, recent COVID pandemic. And it's interesting that the original best practices it may or may not have lined up with that, depending on your organization. For us at Beyond Trust, we've really seen several key trends. Um, I think this is probably quite common for, for Kevin as well, so be interested to hear what he says. First of all, remote access. You know, IAM leaders were faced overnight with a challenge of how do we present business continuity here and enable remote work? And you know, what are we going to do in this new normal? That, that was the first challenge they had to solve. The second was the kind of total understanding of enterprise IT being cloud hybrid. You know, when some best practices around that remote access were created, every network was on premise. And it's very different today with the attractiveness and the uh, adoption of cloud technologies. 
certainly as well. Um, I know personally in my family, having to watch my nephew use different bits of equipment, mobility has become much more important. You know, whether you're working off of a Chromebook, a phone, or a, a traditional laptop or desktop, maybe a virtual desktop, or the enterprises have to kind of respond to that. Um, as well as then, you know, Internet of Things, lots of connected devices everywhere, lots of identities on those. Uh, reporting back from sensors and collecting analytics. So very, very interesting area, probably one of the most important areas now that identity is really the new perimeter. Yes, I mean, it's certainly, thanks Carl, it's certainly very key. And certainly from an Okta point of view, we've seen a huge uplift in the demand for supporting remote workers and the enablement of remote workers. A lot of organizations were caught on the hop. They had some plans, they were thinking about moving to the cloud slowly. But all of a sudden, instead of a three months or six month planning exercise, they had they were given a week, if that. And certainly we've worked with a large number of organizations from finance services through to healthcare, through to uh, even cruise liners and various other organizations that have been moving a significant number of users from their normal work environment out to a different work environment. So enabling team access or uh, video conferencing and things of that nature, just remote access as a whole has been the key thing. The common amongst them all is the need to do it quickly, and the other one is to enable it, enable those access, access users to have the ability to do single sign-on, and typically wanting to apply multi-factor authentication on top of that to give strength of identity, yet at the same time trying to make sure it's a sort of friendly experience for the users. There have been a couple of instances I've come across where people are trying to use VPNs, and there's just VPN overload. So they're trying to expand capacity there, switching out to cloud services. Um, so it's been, been an interesting experience watching some of these organizations struggle with it and then others cope with it very well. And yes. those that go cloud are very definitely the, the ones who take the advantage. Absolutely. And I think sometimes there's too much reliance on the VPN angle. Um, you know, uh, if we have VPN, everything is secure. Um, that's a different discussion for a different day, I guess. Um, but but Kevin and Carl, it's really interesting because speed is has been almost a prerequisite to get everybody up and running, apart from actually maybe buying the hardware so that people could work from home. But one of the dangers, and I'm, I think you, hopefully you agree, and what, so the question is, one of the dangers of getting things done very quickly is the wonderful word, word misconfiguration right um oh indeed indeed <laughs> and and i think if, if misconfiguration wasn't a word i think none of us would be in a in a job necessarily right mm -hmm. um, because everything would just work so i guess the the interesting question comes up because identity and and strength of identity are so important and then if you if you add the angle of privileged identity it becomes even more important now, given the complications of work from home, support from home, forget work from home, support from home, uh, troubleshoot from home, uh, identify from home, the whole thing, you know what I mean, right? So mm -hmm. how individually, maybe start with you first, Kevin, and then Carl, if I go to you then, how are you, in terms of your product, the offering, how is that being, Can how can someone manage that angle? Spinning up is something is very easy. I agree. It's maybe with Okta and Beyond and Bomb, um, Beyond Trust kind of solution. But how do you then take a step back and start to go? Have we done this correctly? This is a very good question indeed. So one of the, one of the key elements, as you say, is it's, it's easy to spin these things up fairly quickly. But if you're not got careful control of it from an organisation point of view, then you're going to get identity cloud service sprawl. So one of the key messages from an Okta point of view is to use and ensure using a cloud identity broker service to give a single identity and help the organization retain control. That's a great benefit to the administrators in configuration using automated wizard tools to actually make sure that the done things are done in the same way at the same time in the right ways. So certainly the Okta integration network there gives the benefit of walking people through to do the right configuration. And therefore, um, you know, that's they can do it right from that perspective. But you're right, from a configuration check point of view, how do you do actually validate and health check it and things? The great advantage of cloud service is being pre-built environments rather than someone having to spend building up layers of hardware, the operating system, supporting infrastructure and things of that nature. By being a cloud-based service, you don't have those worries or concerns. Do you have to patch it? It's just a service there that you can consume and use. So there's certainly some distinct advantages from that point of view. 
But at the end of the day, configuration of access controls. I mean, there's some well-known examples there in AWS S3 buckets and exposing information incorrectly. But it is just a matter of making sure people are educated and actually have the support that they need. Okay, excellent. Carl, what are your thoughts on this? So again, re really similar. I think with Beyond Trust, we're very much focused in that privilege access management space. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of our kind of work is around reducing risk. So understanding how people are accessing critical data, applications in, in the credentials and keys used to get there. Um, a key part of our portfolio is our secure remote access tool. So you can imagine uh, just the impact that's had for, for our organization and other organizations during this crisis. And mm -hmm. re really, when we go to an organization who seeks our help, we're, we're seeing that they've kind of loosened up a lot of their policies and they're now trying to kind of dial in the security, um, you know, practices like, um, you know, loosening up a bring your own device policy, allowing, you know, potentially untrusted devices in to bridge this gap. Yeah. Um, personal business on corporate issued laptops. I mentioned earlier with my nephew borrowing equipment mm -hmm. um, from, from my brother, it, it happens. A, a big rise in kind of insecure or uh, free remote access tools. And they're kind of looking to now gain control and visibility over that. Um, as well as then, you know, the, the darker side of things where there's been an increase in social engineering, certainly seen reports from World Health Organization saying, well, you know, more phishing attempts are coming out related to COVID. And then with that becomes uh, the malicious software and introducing malware from home. I think really for us, it, it's all around securing and protecting that privilege, but also the pathway into those critical systems. Like, being able to say, well, actually, you can work safely and effectively, very quickly, and we're going to protect your privilege every time. Now, Carl, I'm going to uh, get you to expand a little bit on that because you've hit a very important point because privileged users obviously uh, are privileged um, and they have the additional uh, benefit, I would say is the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying, the additional power to, to bring down an organization completely. So... In terms of what Beyond Trust it does, in how how does it help me? A in terms of the actual maybe a little bit of a nitty gritty in there, but how does it help me? Because now my privileged users are working from home. Um, I may have had some control while they were on premise, but I have now, as you're saying, device sharing, working from anywhere. I mean, home is what? What is home? It's just remote, right? Uh, yes. No, con right? So. How am I, as an organization, going to get some sense of assurance that the privileged the privileged element, that privileged user, is not abusing their privileges? Am I making sense? You are, yes. Yeah. So I think it's it's really important to frame that with you know, what what is a privileged account? And traditionally, that's very much been your admin, your domain administrator, your root account. But actually, as we're seeing the uh, kind of adoption and transformation of businesses and this kind of hybrid IT cloud approach. Really, those privileged accounts are just anything that's more than a standard user. So any, anything that has an elevation of privilege over a regular person. And they're becoming more numerous and widespread. You know, and it can be anything from, as mentioned earlier, an administrator to maybe even a, a corporate Twitter account. You know, if if, uh, if the Bright Talk um, account was compromised and they posted information about people's sessions, well, you know, that's a privileged information that, that's being leaked in a breach. So what Beyond Trust really does to defend against threats with stolen credentials is uh, really allow you to gain that visibility. So automatic discovery, being able to take credentials under management, and then allow users to, to have that right level of privilege just in time, so when they actually need it. And we take away a lot of the barriers of the kind of traditional uh, legacy solutions and make it a very frictionless experience to really focus on enhancing productivity. So it, it may be a case of, well, I'm an administrator. I want to connect to a server. Well, that's mm -hmm. fine. You know, let's get you through our platform, do some posture checks, make sure you are who you say you are, integrating into something like Okta for strong authentication, and then bring you through to the device you need to manage. Okay, very useful. Um, Kevin, now, single sign-on has been around for a while. I think many people may not understand what it means, but they 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 reap the benefits of single sign-on every day. Um, is there anything that organizations are doing today that is different because of the realities are changing in terms of remote access becoming the norm? But 
when they are looking at Okta and they're saying, right, what else can I integrate? What are organizations doing today? Yes, very good question. I mean, it all comes, as you say, single sign-on has been around for a while, but with MTN Access Moments, it's, it's more than just single sign-on. It's very much there about life cycle management as well as the access control. So they, they go hand in glove. So particularly with the cloud services, if you sort of have particularly shadow IT type cloud, you don't have control. So if you take it back to what an organization is really trying to do, is provide a seamless user experience where it's a single identity that's used by that user across multiple cloud services. So whether they're accessing a Salesforce, ServiceNow, Concur, WebEx, different types of services using this, the same single identity, then it's a lot easier for the organization to manage those users and be aware of what those users are doing. And as you quite rightly were identifying earlier in terms of those that need privileged or elevated access, they can be assigned that. And you can then assign things like multi-factor authentication and step up as policies by group. So you can say this group of users can have straightforward access using say touch ID or some form of passwordless identity. Mm -hmm. But then an administrator goes in and we need to do a step up and just validate it really as that user. But equally, um, you know, people are accessing these from not only their corporate issued devices, but now, as mentioned by Carl, everywhere, yeah. you know, bring your own device from everywhere. So we need to start thinking that this physical perimeter of the network, or the way people used to do it, is, oh, if you're in the office network, you're safe. If you're outside the office network, right. you need to do step up authentication and things. Yeah. Those boundaries have melted, for want yeah. of a better word, or they've got so many holes in them now that they can't be trusted. So you've now got everybody coming from different places. So the new perimeter is very much identity, the individual, and the strength of that identity. And the key point here is that you want to get policies in place that says who has access to what and how are they using it. And that's where the single sign-on perspective comes from, is applying and working on that principle. But it's supported by the likes of lifecycle management, ensuring that the same user identities are available in each of these cloud services. So identity provisioning or lifecycle management is a very key element of that. And for a lot of organizations, say so the, the core identities are currently, they think they're held in Active Directory, but in reality, they're potentially coming from an HR system or some form of human resource identity, which identifies them as employers, contractors, B2B partners. So we end up with profiles for people and the type of access they should have access to. And you build up this whole holistic source of the truth of who has access to what and how they're using it. That's the key mm -hmm. question that really comes back to. Correct. Me. No, absolutely. Um, something else, and it's, which is really kind of close to my heart, is operational friendliness is what I call it, right? The o OF factor. I mean, you can have the greatest and best solution, but if no one knows how to use it, um, or if the operators take too long to use it, it's of little value. Um, again, given the current reality, how, and, and coming back into automation, um, Kevin, if I start with you and then back to Carl, what kind of automation is there? I know you talked about provisioning, et cetera. Uh, is there enough automation to make support and administer and operation easy? Oh, certainly. There's numerous types of operations and automations these days. And as you quite rightly say, in terms of consistency, even back when you mentioned there about configuration consistency, provision consistency is one of those key things because the audit guys, if you've got those audit guys that looking at you from that perspective, want to see repeatable actions and the yep. users treated in exactly the same way to make their life easy. If those operations aren't done consistently, then it makes the auditor's life more interesting trying to collate all that information. Back to that question, who has access to what and how they're using it? But the auditor's question on the back of that is who gave them that access in the first place? Correct. Who approved it? So having a request process is one of those ways. So you could actually have request automation. You could have lifecycle automation onboarding users in the same way. And then from that triggering, as I say, provisioning or automation into target apps. So new users starting, how do they go about getting access on day one to those all those cloud services? By having a centralized identity provider, you can actually achieve that. It's automating there. New capabilities that are coming out, uh, things like workflows, the ability to then do additional beyond just provisioning. A lot, for a lot of organizations, provisioning is typically just creating the account. That's great. But then it's joining those accounts together or providing that user information about how to go about using that account. Or maybe there's a step control where they've got to pass some training first before they're allowed access into that system. 
there's sort of provisioning and workflow controls from, from that point of view. So that's all about automation for the, the user, but equally from a monitoring, configuration, onboarding, there's the ability there through APIs in a lot of places. You can actually do automations of scripts or using orchestration DevOps tools, the likes of Jenkins, Terraform, and some other tools that allow you to do and create definitions of script-based automation. And uh, you know, a lot of the cloud environments do that from software-based configuration tools these days. So again, it's very important you do Excellent. that, but you need to control the identities in those configuration tools as well. So yes. identities for APIs as well as for individual users is a good thing to have. Oh, that's good. Good there, Carl. Th thank you, Kevin. Carl, on this question of automation, focusing on privileged access management, um, there's 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 two schools of thought. One is automation is obviously very good, but because it's privileged users, there needs to be manual intervention. What are your thoughts, and what can what can Beyond Trust's tool do in terms of automation? So I think it's really interesting. We hear this. You know, there needs to be manual intervention. <laughs> Typically, what I find is it's, it's off the back of a security assessment and you're told to reduce the number of administrator accounts you have, you know, pull down the number of people with privilege. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where I think automation plays a, a really good, strong part in this. And it, it beyond trust, we, we kind of liken this to just in time. So you've, you've heard just in time or just in just enough administration um, concept taken from manufacturing, where actually rather than having standing privilege and, and um out there mm -hmm. all of the time. You move to a model where actually it is part of a workflow. You know, there are triggers that are context aware. Should you have strong extra authentication? Are you entitled to even have this level of privilege? And then the important part really comes into the method. And again, with this kind of transformation we've seen away from you know traditional accounts and groups as, as you would find in a Microsoft network to roles and identities. So how do we elevate that privilege? And there's a lot of automation there, whether that's you know, elevating just a, a token on a system for an application, whether it's creation, deletion of accounts, moving membership, adding to a role, impersonation. Um, really, it then feeds into the next side, which is the policy-driven automation. So looking at governance and identity tools to say, well, you know, is this correct? Should they have this level of access? Um, have they been terminated as an employee? Do we need a ticket before this happens? Are, are there risks of lateral movement? And I, I think trying to do that manually would just become a burden for an mm -hmm. IT security team. Absolutely. You know, if you follow those security principles of establish context, make compromise difficult, and make detection easier, well, adding all of those stages might seem counterintuitive if it's manual, but when you automate that, actually it provides a really good robust uh, security model around privilege. Absolutely, yes. Um, okay, Carl, sticking with you now, if you don't mind. So uh, I'm a CISO. I want to look at, you know, a solution. My, one of my biggest challenges is, is visibility, number one. The other is possibility of identity abuse, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to privileged users. So implementing, operating, all brilliant. But from the governance, from the element of, what visibility do I am I able to maintain, and an early detection? So, and Carl, I'll come to you. Sorry, Kevin, I'll come to you after that. But early detection of possible malicious activity is godsend, if that's the best word for me. As a CISO, I need that early indication rather than after, as they say, the horse has gone and you know behind. So, how is Beyond Trust? Are there any features that? that are there that allow me this early indication of malicious activity? There are. So mm -hmm. first of all, the kind of early indication is the limiting of privilege in points of administration. Mm -hmm. you know, by, by having that centralized and um, managed for you in some way through automation, well, actually, you're, you're going to gain visibility just on the reporting from there. What what we do at Beyond Trust, we, we take this concept of universal privilege management. So it's it's not just focusing on credential based it's actually protecting all of the privilege across your universe and the idea here is it then gives you the visibility it's, it's one thing you know knowing a password has been changed and we've managed to hit, hit our metric of doing that every 30 days mm -hmm. but actually what, what's more important is how that's being used you know which endpoints you're logging into what are the tasks you're running when you get there and so we pull everything into our reporting analytics platform called beyond insights 
Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't matter which pillar you kind of start with in our portfolio, actually that common underlying reporting uh, gives you that visibility of actually what's happening with privilege in my environment now. And using either pre-built or, or custom reports, you can then alert based on that. And I think it's, it's very important to think of this not as an island, but actually as a, a rich data source for other tools and things you may already have in your security stack. So we could give you context from, you know, maybe you're collecting logs and you're putting them into uh, an ALK stack and saying, well, someone's logged into this system. That's great. You've pulled that from the Windows event log or the Linux mm -hmm. uh, log. Mm -hmm. But we're giving the context then of, well, what's actually happened when they've logged in there? Like, how did they use privilege once they're in that session? And all the way down to even a, a video recording of that activity. So you okay. can, can get to a really granular point of, well, I understand why it's happened. Mm -hmm. I've controlled how it's happened, and I have a report and audit trail of everything that did happen, either for analysis after the fact or in real time. Okay, that's very useful. Um, thank you. Kevin, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, again, the spectrum of, there I use that word, the spectrum of cloud apps that you cover in single sign-on, um, it kind of opens the, the possibility of abuse, right? Um, how are you detecting um, and, and am I making sense and that visibility? Yes, no, 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 it's, yeah. it's very key. As, as Carl was yeah. saying, the key, the key here is actually ensuring that the the human that's behind the device that's making the access request is actually the, the appropriate human that the accesses were assigned to in the first place. So it starts again back at the lifecycle management side of making sure that the actual accounts only have the necessary access to achieve what they're trying to do. So limiting privilege access is one of those key things. But the other thing is making sure that things like passwords accounts are not compromised or shared. And this, this sort of plays to the zero trust model of the old school was zero trust where if you're inside the perimeter, doesn't matter what you do, you could do it and there was no strong audit on it. Whereas today it's really about that combination of the user, the device that's trusted and the applications and the relationship of how that Rather than assuming that the network is safe, take a zero trust approach and assume that you know, there's horrible things out there all over the place. It may be on the internet. It's also potentially on your network as well, whether you've got VPNs or other things. But taking a zero trust approach really allows you to assess those relationships and put the monitors in place. So from an Okta perspective, when a user's logging in, there's a lot of assessment goes on behind the login box behind the logon box, we've actually okay. got the ability to track history. Have we seen mm -hmm. that user before? Have we seen that user on that device before? Mm -hmm. Was it a good Was it a good activity? Uh, authenticating the user using multi-factor authentication or passwordless increases the strength. And it's all about increasing the confidence and the, you know, the level of trust that the user has got. And then applying policies to that, say, is this app, you know, what's the risk level on this app? Is it a simple app, say it's the lunch menu for an organization? That's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, may, it may not be a lot of use in the COVID times at present, but it's a sort of low-level app right through to more sensitive apps for the, the privileged ones, in which case they should be using the likes of a privilege access management solution. But it's that whole spectrum. So we've got various controls in there to detect potential account misuse, account takeover. We've also got the ability to integrate with a lot of third-party services that can do additional checks. So things like identity validation, verification, identity proofing, some of those are through the registration process. So registration mm -hmm. is a very key area of weak point, particularly for account takeovers. And then you've got the ongoing use of, is it the actual user on that particular device or set of devices? And how have we seen history? Or even geolocation, there's various controls for behavioral and risk-based analysis that we can actually do as well. So we get quite a range of controls. And then how do we report that? We move that into, like Carl was saying, um, feeding that into SEIM tools or specific mm -hmm. analysis tools that can correlate and build up that picture of what's happening across the whole platform. So again, from an Okta point of view, where we're doing central identity control, we can apply those policies and controls on a central basis rather than rely on individual administrators to set policies at each app access point. We can collectively control that from a central point of view and therefore the corporation organization can have a more confident control of what's actually going on and how those users are making use of those access. A question has come up um, about an interesting question, actually. It asks, um, if I want to highlight or, or watch certain users, um, 
for whatever reason, right? Am I make, uh, I'm trying to make sense of the question. I'm just trying to read it. So would it be possible? I'll start with you, Kevin, first, and then Carl, I'll come to you. It's a good question in a, in, in, in a sense. If, if I have a bunch of users or a, a single user that I want to keep an eye on uh, more than the others um, to, to, to see if there's any possible ad malicious activity, is, is that a feature that's there or is that something that can be done? I mean, certainly from an Okta point of view, you can actually sort of draw a history and report on the usage of accounts. And we have some elements there relating to malicious use or non-intended use based upon some policies. But if the question is specifically asking you, are they able to impersonate or look over the shoulder of a user access? Um, you do so hit some privacy issues there from, from that yeah. point of view. Yeah, and I think Carl's, certainly from Beyond Trust's point of view, they've probably got a more appropriate solution yeah. for helping yeah. endpoint users from that perspective. I, I guess the, the angle I'm coming from, just to speak out aloud here, and I think where I'm trying to read in that question, the, the angle is... You know, you know when when people may uh, give their resignation. I don't know example, right? When people submit ah, right, their right. right, they submit their resignation, and you want to go, okay, right, watch this user, right, keep keep an eye on him or her. I think that's where maybe the question is coming from. Is that something that can be done in addition to the reporting that you're doing, Kevin? Oh, certainly you can highlight things and you can enhance some of the actual monitoring. Um, you can. Certainly. Right. Yeah, use, I mean, there's combinations. You can produce reports and act. But if it is a, a sort of resignation or something like that, then it's worth putting some controls in place to review what's going on and potentially even remove some of the more sensitive yeah. access yeah. from that user immediately. So it's, it triggers some form of deprovisioning review. Yes. And then, yes. Um, so, yes, I mean, you certainly would like want to highlight to an auditor of, or somebody that you know that needs looking at very carefully. And to your point earlier that you said, really, you want to make sure that happens before the horse is bolted. Correct. And a lot of traditional uh, identity governance reviews have always happened on the days or after the event. That's the problem. Yeah. Really, what you want to do is you want to apply the controls there and then. Right. So you can actually put some additionals in place. So if you, for instance, if you start spotting that the user is using a net new device or something, you could block the access and say, hang on. Why are they changing profile in, the, in how they use things today? Right. That's okay. That's a good one also. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. So you can, uh, going this, uh, Carl, I'll come to you once again. So uh, in addition, the policy element can go if someone does change, and if it's an extremely critical app, if someone even changes the browser, um, can you go either block or, or challenge more? Could you do that, Kevin? Yes, so certainly from that yeah. point of view, I mean, some of the risk-based profiles are actually down to the, the browser level at the sandbox. Excellent. So you can identify some of those devices. You can have additional policies there that do things like treating it as a net new device, a net new location. And depending on the number of trigger points, you could do some policy control based upon that. Excellent. Carl, so coming to you um, in terms of privileged, and again, I know I'm repeating, but repetition is key. Privileged users can cause significant damage. So... If we know a certain privilege user is uh, about to resign or just what I know, there's a lot of recording going on, a lot of editing, uh, auditing going on. What what do you recommend, or and what can Beyond Trust do to make sure that it doesn't kind of go all the way? So certainly, caveat this with making sure, you, as an employer, you have a written policy and procedure yes, around yes. employee monitoring. So Absolutely. Make, make sure your, your base is covered there. Yes. Um, I, I think really for us, uh, we're very much in the space of when privilege is used, how are they going to use that? Is that appropriate and justified? And if we can still answer those questions, you know, whether an employee leaves, um, has resigned, or is, is current, you know, the, the situation doesn't change. And we need to make sure that this is justified, reasonable, and we give them just enough privilege to be able to do that task. Um, I think, by and large, it becomes more of a, a governance issue and part of your joiners, movers, leavers process of, do you want those users to be able to perform privileged tasks in that period? And maybe it, it gets to a line where, well, actually you do. However, you would want someone else to shadow them at that time, to have that kind of four eyes principle. Mm -hmm. and and. Maybe, again, similar to the kind of contextual aware stuff you, you heard from just a second ago is, well, if they're connecting from an IP range and at a different time of day to normal, 
should we apply different controls? Well, absolutely, that, that's not normal. Like we want to know about those events and we want to do something to stop those. So lots of different kind of configurable options. I would say it's, you know, have that thought process beforehand of what should we do in this scenario? I think four eyes monitoring plus the duplication of effort during a resignation period is also a really good way to knowledge transfer. Yes. So maybe it can be as simple as that. Can you, is that, in, is that enforceable? Am I making sense of my question? Yes, it is. Yeah. So you could enforce okay. that. You know, all sessions have you know, multiple approvers or, or different people present um, before you're able to actually connect and, and see that. Ah, okay. You know, similarly, you might want to say, well, you can connect through session management and have your session audited, but we don't want you to be able to expose the password like that. You could go to, to kind of those different workflows as well. And are there, is that something easy to do? And uh, the reason I ask is uh, going back to the 4i and additional workflow. So we know someone's planning to leave and we can just say, listen, the new workflow means instead of one person having to approve, two people now need to approve because of remote working. Is that something that's easy to manage? Am I making sense in my question? Yes, you are. I think it's it's very simple. Okay. Um, you know, a series of tick boxes will cover that for you. Right. I think what, what's really important, again, is I come back to this not being an island and integrating with something like Okta makes it even simpler. So Excellent. we can have all of the policies kind of defined there, ready to go, and then allow as part of the automated uh, provisioning and deprovisioning processes within Okta, allow that to control what happens in our system. And that, that's where I think we really stand out is that interoperability across different platforms already in your organization. Excellent. That's very useful. Um, time runs very fast, actually. I mean, we could spend much more time. I have a question on incident um, in, in investigations, right? So we do a lot of cyber crisis planning and management services. And one of the challenges that clients always face is um, during uh, what I call the golden hour, right? During the beginning of the incident, um, seeking factual information is of paramount importance, but a big headache for many, many people, right? So what I'm trying to understand is, in your particular solution, uh, in terms of beyond trust, Carl, mm -hmm. during an incident, is it easy for to, to go and say, what did Amar do from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m.? Uh, and, and and not just search. Yes, I understand that's search, but I'm talking about because I, if I'm the investigator, I I I I I don't just need to ask that question. I need to build a narrative around that. Am I making sense? You absolutely are, and I think it's that narrative that's very important. Yeah. And, and kind of coming back to my earlier point, you know, doing a security investigation and working in investigation tool sets what we want to provide you is a rich data source of context around privilege use. So you can absolutely search for that in our platform. You, you know, we have the analytics there. However, I think that the real value comes in integrating into some of those orchestration automation response tools in, in putting that context in place. So rather than just potentially seeing, you know, two segments of an attack chain, whether that's privilege escalation, lateral movement, actually you're getting the kind of narrative end to end across all of it. Mm -hmm. from one one view and again that it's just so important to even collect this information in the first place because yeah. at the heart of every data breach you know re read whichever report you want a privileged account will be misused yes and and a quick question uh, before i go to kevin a quick question you know you do uh, in fact we had one client obviously no names of the, of, of anybody um they had so much recorded privileged uh uh, sessions, they didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> um, yep. how, how, what are your thoughts on how do you solve that headache? Because it's almost like having CCTV. Um, I, I mean, I'm guilty. I have a CCTV recording, which I haven't looked at for six months now. Um, and, and I need six months to look at it. If you see what I mean, right? Um, how, how does someone solve the problem? Because everyone does want to record and, and uh, keeping privacy aside for a second, privileged uh, administrators know that they're being recorded um, in most cases. How do you manage this this headache of so much data? So I, I certainly think from kind of the privilege recording space and session management is, well, there, there's a point at which that data is no longer valuable or required. Mm. If you think of kind of the similar principles with personal data with GDPR is 
well, actually, three months, six months down the line, has our environment changed significantly from when those actions were taken? Correct. Probably. Um, so I would say limit data retention to what's useful and what's relevant. You know, being able to store everything forever, you know, great, great concept. And sadly, you know, regulations may require you to store it for even longer, but there are a lot of kind of offline, longer term storage options. And then being able to index that you know, using things like uh, Microsoft SQL, so open standard, open source, or putting that information again into other tools. So maybe a ticketing system, you know, logging privilege use alongside change management and, and change tickets would be very helpful. And again, creating links to those recordings to refer back to it for the extra context. No, excellent. Okay, just a, a reminder to all the listeners, um, you reach out to core to cloud info at core to cloud .co .uk for engaging and actually kind of understanding how the particular vendors uh, can help you. Uh, core to cloud will obviously work with you to help you on there. Uh, look at the downloads the section and even now and after the webinar is over downloads may be added so keep keep coming back and taking a look and uh, we are now towards the kind of closing end of this um if uh, i guess kevin if you take that question the one that i asked carl a little bit earlier um very briefly in terms of during an incident um what kind of data can I get as a CISO and I'm or an investigator? I'm investigating. Can I build a quick narrative uh, that is factual? Yes, I mean it's, it's very key. There's, there's several elements to that. Uh, obviously, core identity or the ability to identify the individual by their actual identity account. If they got a single identity, it's a lot easier than if you have to go chasing around translation of different account names and different account formats and the different types of services. But um, amassing, you know, on the assumption you can actually amass log information from the individual cloud services from a core identity point of view, it, that will give you an index into it. So, like your previous question there of how do you know which which video and visual things to look at, having your trigger point or incident point is a very you know, good way of perspective. So from a OXA point, this is where things like behavioral profiling and indication of potential increased risk or out of, out of normal behavior profiling can give you a point to go and look at. Um, again, MFA usage, if there's then uh, unusual device, new device or something out of the normal, that's really mm. where the behavioral profiling things can come in and give you some indication towards that. But at the back end of it, Octo logs uh, everything from administration changes to user activity to what it can in terms of where the identity has been validated and then passed over to a cloud service. So you'll certainly get trigger points and indi indications of where to go and look for additional information. Excellent. Um, Okay, that's quite useful. I mean, like I said, we could spend a lot of more time. We are mm -hmm. forty. We are forty-five minutes into the webinar. Um, uh, Kevin, I'll start with you, and then Carl, I'll come to you. If you take a minute and summarize your thoughts on what people should do and uh, to try to resolve this, I know the products do offer the solutions, but your kind of professional opinion, your closing thoughts, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah, I mean, one of the key messages from an Okta point of view is that we've been operating as a cloud-based identi cloud identity service that was born and built in the cloud for the last 10 years. There's a significant number of users who are actually making use of the service day on a daily basis. Okta's always on, and it's very easy and simple to actually build up and provide that common identity service across multiple cloud environments. So whether you're using one, two, four, 50 cloud services, you're improving your user experience and ease of use. And where it's ease of use, they'll adopt it easier. And that user, ease of use is not just the end user, but also the administrators making life easy by integrating to the likes of lifecycle management processes or single sign on, plug and play, um, adopting new capabilities and expanding is very much a key capability. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Carl? Uh, I think for us at Beyond Trust, really, it is thinking of this concept of universal privilege management to secure and protect your privilege across passwords, endpoints, and your access. You know, it's giving you as a business the visibility and control you need to reduce risk, achieve compliance, and improve your operational performance. And r really, at Beyond Trust, our solutions are easy to deploy, manage, and, and scale with your business. Um, we've got about 20,000 customers, 70% uh, of the Fortune 500, and really great partners like Core to Cloud that know our technology very well and 
offer us some expertise. Excellent. Uh, yes, to I'll, I'll quickly summarize this. I think identity and access are definitely, and they've always been, but today more than ever, they are the parameter. There is no other parameter other than the identity and access. And as an organization, as regardless of size, you need to focus on on getting a your getting a grasp of this problem. Uh, if you don't manage it, it'll it'll come back and bite you big time. Um, I want to thank Call the Cloud. I want to thank Kevin and Carl and all the listeners for listening in. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.